Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to day three of Stream School for the Rahway River Watershed Association and Sauerland Conservancy. Uh, tonight, we will be reviewing the most common macroinvertebrates that we tend to find in New Jersey. Um, we will go over them, each taxa, the order, the family, we'll be reviewing some of the most distinguishing characteristics to help you with your identifications in the field. Um, so one thing I wanna mention right off the bat is that this presentation will show the organisms pretty large scale. You'll get to see all of these fine features in these photos. Um, you'll get to see everything that we're looking for because it's a photo and it's enlarged. Um, when we actually are looking at the organisms in the field, however, they will tend to be, you know, maybe the size of your fingernail or even smaller, maybe a little bit larger. So that's kind of the scale of size that we will find when we actually see these guys up close and in real life. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, when we're looking for these characteristics, things like three tails or two tails, it'll be very obvious to us when we're looking at a photo, um, but we want to make sure that we're also calibrating our eyes for things that we can look for and find when we're out in the field and we don't have any microscopes to help us. So let's go ahead and get started. If you'd like to take notes, I invite you to do so. Um, we'll also make this presentation available to you all. Um, after the fact, so you can review it ahead of our identification test, which is next Saturday. So first, let me just hide that. Okay. First, I'd like to review the taxonomic hierarchy. For some of us, it may have been a while since we took a biology class. Um, so this is the structure. This is how we classify organisms, right? Kingdom, is the highest includes you know, the, the most, the greatest number of organisms within that, that kingdom classification. And then as you move down to phylum, to class, it gets a little bit more specific. So this is the taxonomic hierarchy for the polar bear. And so you can see when we get to the order level, that's when we find that the polar bear is a carnivore and that includes the polar bear and the black bear and the panda and the red fox. When we get to the family, that's when we can define the polar bear as a bear and only combine it with other bears that fit into that same um, family taxa. When we are identifying our insects and crustaceans, we are identifying them at the order and family level. So. Uh, Really, this, this graphic is to try to help us think about the great diversity that can occur when you call something, say, a mayfly, which is at the order level, Ephemeroptera, there's still going to be a number of families under that order heading, and even more genera under that and more species. And so when we call something a mayfly, that mayfly can look like many different things. And we'll see that in this presentation. Um, so it's important that even though we're classifying all these things that may look a little bit different as the same taxa, we're recording them all as a mayfly, we will definitely see diversity in how these organisms are presented. So Within the, the major orders that we will identify with the mayflies, we've got 19 different families and over 2,000 species. And, and these numbers are for you know, global, worldwide numbers. This is not necessarily the number of species that we will find here in New Jersey. Um, but this kind of gives you some context as to the diversity that we will find. Um, especially, you know, under the beetles, for example, there's 5,000 families of beetles. Only 30 of those are going to be aquatic families. So um, there's a lot out there. And what we'll present today is just a sampling, really, of all of that diversity of all of these different families and orders. We 
narrow our identification down to these 22 different taxa. This is done because um, we have an index scoring system where each of these organisms has a pollution tolerance value associated with it. So things like the caddisfly, the mayfly, and the stonefly, they have a low pollution tolerance value. You'll only find these species in streams that are uh, on the more pristine side. Um, other taxa like the midge flies, the black flies, and the worms, those have a very high pollution tolerance value. So we'll tend to see those taxa with a high pollution tolerance at more of our monitoring sites. So here is the list of taxa that we will be reviewing today. And before we get there, I just wanna review a little bit about insect anatomy because we'll be using these terms a bit as we move forward. Um, you may remember that an insect has uh, three major segments on its body. And if you can see the mouse here, I'm circling the head. This is that first capsule. Um, sometimes it's very distinctive, other times it's not as obvious, or it might be hiding underneath um, the tissue of the thorax. The thorax is that second segment. Here we have a three-segment, three-segmented thorax, and you can see these hardened plates on each of those segments. So the head has this hardened capsule, and the thorax has hardened plates on one, two, three of its segments. After the thorax, we have the abdomen. With this particular organism, the abdomen here is fleshy. And so we try to, to convey that by having, you know, it's colored not so dark here. And on the abdomen or on the thorax with some taxa, we will find gills. And so these organisms, clearly they live underwater. They need to be able to breathe the dissolved oxygen there. So we'll find gills presented in a variety of different ways as we look at these taxa. There's different ways that the organisms have, have their legs structured as well. This organism here on the right, this is a mayfly nymph. We have three pairs of jointed legs. And what that means is that we have, what it basically looks like an elbow, right? We've got this really buff, forearm and we've got this jointed segment and we have even what kind of looks like a toe or tarsal, tarsal claw there at the end of that leg. We will also find filaments or hair-like projections um, from the end of the body with some of, of these taxa. The mayfly here represented here has three tail filaments. You can see that. On the organism on the bottom, this is a chironomid or midge fly larva. We have the head, the hardened head segment. We have the thorax, we have the abdomen, but we don't have any jointed legs. Instead, what the, the midge fly shows are a pair of pro legs underneath the head and right here at the end of the body. And so the prolegs, you know, the midge fly in its larval form is not so well adapted to kind of walk around, crawl around on rocks as you might expect something like the mayfly nymph to be because these legs are really, you know, well developed. It can move around really well. The midge fly only has these prolegs to kind of help itself, you know, position itself. On the right, we see wing pads. So if you remember from the lecture on day one, when we did an introduction to macroinvertebrates and their collection and where we might find them, uh, we talked a little bit about the insect life cycle and that there are two different types of uh, life cycle that we'll find. One is that complete life cycle where we have the egg going to the larval phase uh, going to a pupal phase and then emerging as an adult. The mayfly nymph here, um, this represents an incomplete life cycle. So you'll see that we don't, we skip over that pupal phase and thus the nymph much more closely resembles what its adult form will be. And for these nymphs, we will see 
the beginning of wings start to develop. And we call these wing pads. So this is a one pair of wing pads. On stoneflies, we'll find two pairs of wing pads. And they can vary in terms of how well they're developed. That really depends on how, how old this organism is, um, what instar it's gotten into, um, and, and just you know how, how much the body has developed by the time that you've gotten uh, it in your net and that you're laying your eyes on it. So the older the um, organism is, the more well-developed these wing pads will be. So now we'll get into an introduction to all of the different taxa from the, our initial list of 22 taxa. Um, with each of the taxa, uh, I'll, I'll have a list here of some distinguishing uh, features of each of the taxa. And in bold, these are the features that are um, probably the most important for you to acknowledge and, and the most important to help us distinguish one taxa from another. So here is the mayfly. We'll start there. You can see we've got the head and the thorax and the abdomen. The thorax, you can see a little bit of these wing pads starting to develop. They usually have this kind of triangular shape right there at the end of the thorax. And so you can see kind of how small they can be, you know, in comparison to that last specimen we saw. Um, we have a single tarsal claw at the end of each leg. So you, you might be able to see right above the head, there's just one little kind of hook-like projection from the end of the leg, and that is the single tarsal claw. Mayflies at the end of the body will always have either two tails or three tails. So this specimen has the three. Uh, sometimes there are fine hairs coming off of these tails. Other times they're just very skinny and, and literally quite hair-like. Um, a big, big feature that you'll want to remember for mayflies is that along the lateral side of the abdomen, just the side of the abdomen here, we have gills. And these gills um, in, in this example are kind of branching and fluffy, um, but the gills can really vary in how they present. And so there are a few different um, movement types of, of mayflies. We have crawlers, we have clingers that are just hanging on tight to rocks, some that are free swimming and so they're, they're a little bit more uh, lithe and look like they can kind of undulate their water or, or undulate their body to swim underwater. Others are burrowing taxa. So they will have these tusks at the top of the head and that kind of helps them to burrow down and kind of nestle into the sediment at the bottom of the stream. So we get another look here at how these tails and the gills can differ between all of the different species of mayfly. Um, here we have three tails up top and there's kind of um, like feathery hairs in between the tails. And the gills here are more rounded and more kind of distinct. On the bottom here, we have these tails that are much longer and much wider apart, but we still have three tails. And we have what's called branching gills. So it kind of comes off in a single filament and then it branches into two different filaments. Um, the gills can also present in, in very different ways. Uh, so on the top here, this is a uh, burrowing mayfly. And so you can kind of see the tusks at the top of the head. And what we have here is we don't have these projections off the side of the abdomen that are, that are as obvious as the other um, specimens that we've seen. Instead, these gills are, they come off of the side, but they tend to kind of gather on the top of the body. And so when we see these, these guys live and in person, um, you will tend to see those gills moving quite a bit because we have put them in a bucket and the bucket, um, it, the water in that bucket tends to be kind of losing dissolved oxygen. It's not being actively aerated like it is in the stream. And so you'll really see these gills going as they're trying to you know, sustain their own levels of oxygen. 
But what's really cool about this particular taxon on the top is the gills are, are more focused on the top of the body because it's a burrowing mayfly. And so it kind of burrows its body underneath and the water above can kind of rush across the top of the body. Um, and so the gills are more, more focused there. So it's more efficient for this taxa to be able to breathe. On the bottom here, this is a, a very different way that the gills are presented. They're kind of rounded squares almost. You can see them, they're still abdominal gills. Um, they they're tend to be kind of at the top portion of the abdomen. And whereas the abdomen itself will be maybe a little bit, it look harder, uh, the gills will be fleshier and they will be moving. And that's really the, uh, one of the great benefits of identifying these organisms when they're alive is that you can see those gills moving. And that really does help with identification. Um, when I tend to do this work, we will uh, preserve the specimens and bring them back to a lab um, so that we can use a microscope and get a much closer look and identify the specimens down to a level lower than order, usually family or genus. Um, but look at these gills go, beautiful. And so here we have very developed wing pads on the back of the body. It's not always the case. Uh, this mayfly you'll see has two tails and that's totally normal for this particular taxa. Um, so two or three tails and always gills along the side of the abdomen or on top of the abdomen. The next taxa that we'll review is the stonefly or order Plecoptera. Um, the, it does look very similar to the mayfly, except with the stonefly, we will only ever have two tails. We will never have three tails on a stonefly uh, unless it's gotten into some you know, nuclear kind of situation where <laughs> you know, it's kind of become deformed. So only ever two tails on, on a normal stonefly. And you may see at the end of each of these legs, we have two tarsal claws. So you'll remember with the mayfly, there was just one of those toes. The stonefly, you can see one of those toes facing in either direction. So we have two tarsal claws at the end of each leg. The stonefly does not have gills along the abdomen. Instead, it has gills along the thorax. So what we kind of call hairy armpit gills. You can see under each of these, these pairs of legs, this little fluffy bit sticking out and those are the gills. Um, we have two pairs of wing pads. You can see that on the second thoracic segment, this kind of triangular shape starting to come out. And on the third thoracic segment, you can, you can see that structure there as well. Um, with the stoneflies, the antenna tend to be longer than that of the um, mayflies. And the eyes will tend to be kind of widely separated on either side of the head. Um, whereas the mayflies, it's, it's generally closer together. So here is another look at a stonefly. We have two tails. We've got um, the three pairs of legs, and sometimes these legs can have little brushy bits on the foreleg there. And you can see these fluffy bits in between each segmented leg, and those are the gills. Here are a few other examples. You can see um, on the bottom here, these wing pads are, are much more developed. They're much more obvious to the, to the naked eye, um, but we see the same characteristics repeated in both of, these or both of these specimens. We have two tails. We do not have any gills along the abdomen. We have these kind of smooth sided, gill or smooth sided abdomens. This is an interesting specimen. This we call the roach like stonefly because it kind of resembles a roach. Um, and so this has its gills on the thorax presented in a different way. They're kind of spiky 
and they're double gills. So they're not so branchy as they appear with, with other species. Um, instead, they just kind of have this, this single formation and are kind of pointy. But again, um, two tails, we have two tarsal claws and no abdominal gills. Now this taxa, this is a, um, oh, and you can see there's a little mayfly hanging around up here. Um, but this large specimen, this is another kind of stonefly. Um, we see the main characteristics, two tails. We've got two tarsal claws. And along the abdomen, this is kind of where it gets a little bit funky. With this particular species, we will kind of see projections along, along the abdomen. Um, and it, you may look at that and say, oh, okay, great, we've got gills, this is a mayfly. But what's going on here is this is really just a projection of the exoskeleton of the abdomen. So the gills are always going to be a little fleshy. They're gonna be able to move. Um, with this species, we'll just see this projection. It's like a hardened bit of the abdomen. Um, so if you see a, a taxa that looks like this, um, you just kind of, you can even feel along the side of the abdomen, or you can flip it over and see that we do have branching gills under um, this leg segment. So that would make it a stonefly. And the other thing, you know, if you are confused, again, you would look at the end of the leg and see that we have two tarsal claws, which would make it not a mayfly. Next, we have the damselfly. This is order Odonata, um, is suborder Zygoptera. And also in the order Odonata are the um, dragonflies, which we will show next. They're just in a different suborder. So the damselflies, you can see, kind of are, are resembling a bit the stonefly and the mayfly. They have the head, the three pairs of segmented legs. And at the end of the body, they've got maybe what, what could be perceived as three tails. But instead, and we'll, we'll see more pictures of this and, and see some of the variety of how this presents. But these are gills at the end of the body and they will tend to be wider and more paddle-like and you will be able to see them moving just like any other gill. Um, so hopefully that will help us distinguish them from the mayflies. Another really- Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, so with the um, damselfly, we also have a, a mouth part here. This is kind of the lower jaw. And if you flip it over, we're looking at the underside of the damselfly now. It almost looks like there's a mask covering the underside of the face. And what this is, is the lower jaw. And when it, you can extend it out here on the, on the bottom right, it is a bit extended out. And this jaw is a little bit more, uh, you know, rounded, more scoop-like you can see that it can extend that lower jaw um, to capture um, a prey and bring it back to eat. And so we'll see that in a second. Um, but here's a, a look at a damselfly as we might see it in real life. So we've got the three pairs of segmented legs along the thorax. The side of the abdomen is smooth. So if we're kind of questioning, is this a damselfly or a mayfly? The mayfly will have gills along the abdomen, the damselfly does not. Instead, the damselfly has these gills at the end of the body, these paddle-like structures. Oh, and here is a look at the damselfly using that lower labium to capture a mosquito larva. So the damselfly, the, the gills at the end of the body, they can be very obviously paddle-like. Others um, may have a more slim kind of, it might more closely resemble a hair-like projection. Um, however, 
the, the mayflies that have these three tails will also have abdominal gills. So if we're seeing a smooth sided abdomen and three tails, we can always flip this specimen over to see if we have that lower labium and that can help us with the identification. With the, with the um, gills, with tails, um, they're kind of sensitive parts of the body. So you'll see in this top specimen, um, we only have one of these paddle-like gills and that's because the other two have unfortunately been ripped off. Um, and that can sometimes happen. Um, so it's important to have some kind of alternative ways to identify the specimen that aren't relying on a single identifying feature. Another thing I wanna mention is that you'll see on the bottom specimen here, the gills are kind of all facing different directions. And this is what I was talking about. When you actually have the specimen in your tray, um, you, will, you will be able to see these gills moving around. And so that will also help in identification. So just to summarize here, the differences between these three taxa, the mayflies will have gills along the abdomen. Uh, and they will have one tarsal claw, one toe. All of these other specimens will have two toes. The stonefly will only ever have two tails. So the damselfly will have three projections at the end of the body. The mayflies can have two or three. The stonefly, just two tails. The stonefly will not have abdominal gills, though it will have, it may have visible gills along the thorax. And the damselfly will have smooth sided abdomen, also no gills along the abdomen. It will have three kind of projections at the end of the body that are not tails, they're instead the gills. And if you flip it over, you will be able to see that mouth part it kind of looks like a mask. Uh, if there are any questions as we're moving along, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I can't see any of the chat when I'm presenting. So Debbie, if you can keep an eye on that and just uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Okay, so onto the dragonfly. This is uh, the same order as the damselfly, but a different suborder, Anisoptera. The dragonflies will tend to be a little bit larger than what I've shown so far. They can be up to about two inches long. They will have a head, the three segmented thorax. Um, we have three pairs of segmented legs. And we have, uh, sometimes the abdomen will be a little bit bulbous at the bottom. So whereas the damselfly was kind of streamlined, very kind of thin from head to tail, the, dam uh, the dragonfly will have a widened end of the abdomen. Uh, we will also have three spikes at the end of the body. So we don't have the tails that we've seen thus far, we can have these spikes. And these spikes can differ in kind of how obvious they are um, to the eye. Um, I just wanted to kind of show this. This is the underside of a dragonfly on the top left. And this is, you may already know, a mayfly on the bottom right. And it's a mayfly because we have gills along the abdomen and three tails. And you can see as it happens, parts of that tail has been cut off. But I wanted to bring your attention to the head. So the head of this mayfly, you know, you really just kind of see these, these natural mouth parts. There's not a whole lot going on um, if you're looking at it, you know, without a microscope. But with this dragonfly, you can see we have this mask-like feature covering the bottom of the head. And that, of course, will be um, that lower lip, that lower labium that it uses to capture prey. And here's another look at how that functions. They can extend that out and grab something and bring it back. The dragonflies, of course, will vary in size, but as I mentioned, they tend to be on the larger side. Um, they can have a, a pretty different structures of the body. This example on the top has a more rounded abdomen, um, while this uh, example on the bottom 
it, it still has that bulbous abdomen, but it, it's maybe a little bit more streamlined than the example on the top. Um, see how we have the spikes at the end of the body for the dragonfly on the bottom, and that's kind of obvious to us. For this specimen on the top, you can see very small spikes sticking out. And so with some of these taxa, it will be a little bit more difficult to identify those spikes, but they should be there. Um, we have two pairs of wing pads for dragonflies, and this will, of course, vary in how well developed they are and, and in how we can perceive them when we're looking at them. Um, with this top right um, example, we see these wing pads are, are quite obvious. On the bottom, you know, this is kind of a fuzzy picture too, but it's, it is definitely more difficult to see. Um, especially with this bottom left taxa, uh, some folks will kind of compare the look of this to a spider, right? It has these long spindly legs with this rounded abdomen, this rounded body. Of course, a spider will have eight legs, will have four pairs of legs. And um, these insects here, the dragonfly will only have three pairs of legs. Onto the case building caddisfly. Um, this is in the family, um, or sorry, order Trichoptera. The caddisflies in the order Trichoptera, we divide these out into two different options on your data sheet. We specify what we call the net spinning caddisfly and the case building caddisfly. So we'll start with this first example here, the case building caddisfly. We've got a, a head that has this hardened capsule. You can kind of see it's, it's this like darker brown, rusty color. We have three pairs of segmented legs. And the thorax, of course, this is the next three segments after the head. So if the head is here, we've got this first thoracic segment is covered with this hardened shell. And we have segments two and three of the thorax that are fleshy. With case building caddisflies, we will never have, oh, only in one rare example, but for our purposes, we will not find a case building caddisfly with all three thoracic segments covered in this hardened shell. It will only ever be one thoracic segment or the first two segments that are hardened with this shell. Now at the end of the body, we kind of, it kind of looks, you know, plump caterpillar like the segmented body. And at the end of the body, we have a pair of pro legs that are sticking out. And each of those has a claw. So you can see it's very small right here. We have this little claw um, at the end of these pro legs. So here's a look at a different type of caddis fly. So remember, we've got this hardened segment for the head and the next three segments are the thorax. So the thorax is where we have each pair of segmented legs coming out. We have one hardened segment, this first segment of the thorax that has this hardened plating. And beyond that, it's quite fleshy. At the end of the body, um, these, this has the pair of prolegs, each with a hook at the end. And the, this pair of prolegs is a bit more obvious than the last example that we just saw. Uh, the caddisflies can come in a variety of colors. They can be green, orange, white, yellow. And um, we don't generally identify them based on color. We wanna make sure that we're looking for these structural features. So again, um, I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm just trying to drive it home here. We have the hardened head and a hardened thoracic segment, just a single hardened thoracic segment. The same with this top example, it's just a little bit more difficult to see. Now the caddisflies will have three pairs of segmented legs. But some of them, like in this top example, 
will be a little bit stumpy. You know, they, they won't look as well developed as others. Um, they may just look kind of like a single projection. Um, and at the end of the body, we still have the pair of prolegs. So two prolegs, each with a hook. Here is another example of our, our caddis lies that we'll find. So say it with me now, hardened head and one hardened thoracic segment just below the head. Um, we've got three pairs of segmented legs. They're kind of small, right? Especially up here near the head. And we've got the fleshy abdomen down to a pair of prolegs, each with one hook. Some of these case building caddis flies will have developed small hairs coming out of the, the side of the abdomen. And that helps it when it um, is building a case, which we'll get a look at here in a sec. And um, these hairs will help that case adhere to its body. I'm just gonna skip over that for now. So here is a look at those cases. Different caddis fly species will build cases from the materials that they'll find around them in, in a stream. Um, some species will prefer to use um, bits of wood that they've stripped and kind of wrapped around them in a circular fashion. Others will build um, their cases out of strips of wood in a more squarey kind of, kind of look, like, like with this example here, if you're following my mouse. You might also find some specimens that are using bits of gravel or rock or even snail shells. And so the caddis flies, they exude um, this, this sticky silk. And so they can, they can stick, basically construct this case and kind of glue it together underwater. And then they can stick their body inside of this case, leaving their head and generally their first pair of legs free. Um, so when we see caddis fly specimens, that explains why sometimes that first pair of legs is a little bit shorter. And that's because, you know, it's just trying to, to fit inside that case and the legs are, are really just helping it to position itself as it's in the stream. Uh. Um, so um, with this next example here, um, we can see how these cases look when they're actually in the environment. So with the top here, this is a, an example of a case where we have um, gravel or bits of sand that are kind of glued together in a rounded fashion around, around um, the caddis fly. They will also use that sticky silk to adhere the case to the rock. So you might see this and they, and they try really hard to blend into the rock because of course that will protect them from predators. Um, with this bottom example, we see kind of these bits of gravel, you know, different colored gravel sticking together. If you were to pick up this rock and feel it with your hand, you can kind of zhuzh these cases right off the side of the rock to dislodge that silk from adhering to the rock. And so you kind of rub the rocks. That's why we rub them underwater and we can dislodge those cases from the side of the rock and get them into our net so we can count them as part of our sample. So here's a look at a caddis fly who is actively preparing its case. Um, you can see we have a snail shell, we have some bits of leaves, we've got some wood, some gravel, sand, it's kind of grabbing <laughs> anything it can find. Um, more typically, the caddis fly will be a little bit more discerning with the um, items it uses to build its case, but this guy is just kind of taking what it what he can get. So the net spinning caddis fly. In that last example, when we were reviewing our case building caddis flies, we were looking at the order Trichoptera. This includes all of the caddis flies. With the net spinning caddis fly, this is just one family within that order, family Hydrocycidae. And we pull this out, we identify the net spinning caddis fly separately from the other caddis flies because its pollution tolerance value is quite a bit higher 
than it is for the other species in the caddis fly order. So again, the reason that we're identifying these taxa is to calculate their pollution tolerance value and get an idea of the overall pollution tolerance value of our full sample. So when the pollution tolerance value of this single family is so much higher than everybody else, we have to pull them out and identify them separately. Luckily for us, the net spinning caddis fly has some very distinguishing features that will help us to distinguish it from all of the other caddis flies. Now the net spinning caddis fly will not build a case. You will never find it inside of a hardened case. Instead, it will build nets. And so it will kind of spin its silk and build kind of a, a wide opened um, net inside which um, we can find fine particulate organic matter just kind of free flowing in the stream and it can catch it in there. And it just hangs back and catches that food. So structurally, um, we have this hardened head at the top, similar to the other caddis flies. But you'll see that with each of these thoracic segments, we have one, two, three, each thoracic segment has that hardened plate. So you might remember from the last group, we only ever had hardened plates on the first segment or the first and second segment. The net spinning caddis fly will have all three segments with that hardened plate. Another thing that's very obvious about the net spinning caddis fly that it does not exist with the other caddis flies is that we have these bushy tufts of gills on the underside of the abdomen. So you, you will have seen caddis flies in the last example with some hairs that come off of the side of the abdomen or on the top of the abdomen. Um, and that kind of helps it adhere its case to the body. With the net spinning caddis fly, it's not hairs, they're real kind of bushy gills. And so they should be visually very different from the hairs that you might find on other caddis flies. Um, we also have um, the pro legs at the end of the body, the hooks at the end of the body. And um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you will also find that bushy tuft, the gills at the end of the body. So you'll see this kind of uh, fluffy projection here um, beyond the pair of pro legs. This is just uh, some additional gills for in that spinning caddis fly. So here's a look at that net spinner sitting inside of its constructed net. You won't always find it inside of a net. Generally, you'll find it kind of um, free flowing, um, especially as we sample, we will kind of dislodge those nets and you'll tend to find the specimens um, just on their own in the sample. So just like with other caddis flies, we have a variety of colors. We might find these net spinning caddis flies in. Um, but you'll see, again, we have this hardened head and one, two, three hardened plates along the abdomen. In this top example, we have a little bit of, you know, schmutz on this third thoracic segment. So it kind of looks like maybe it's not hardened, um, but hopefully if you were to see this in real life, you would see that there is that hardened shell underneath. And the same is true for this bottom example, hardened head and one, two, three hardened plates. We also see in both examples, these bushy tufts of gills on the underside of the abdomen. Of course, in this bottom picture, it's a little fuzzy, um, but they are there. And at the end of the body, beyond the pair of pro legs and pair of hooks, we have this bushy tuft of gills here as well. So um, you'll see in this top example, this is um, a look at, at kind of how it pulls little bits of, of gravel together uh, to construct its net. And so this is what we'll find on the side of rocks that you will kind of just gently rub off with your hand to get that into your net. So just to review the differences between these caddis flies, the case building caddis fly, or what we'll just tend to call, we'll just use the word caddis fly, really, to describe this category. They will have one to two hardened segments on the thorax, and you could find them in a protective case, but there's not abdominal gills. We don't have gills on the underside of the abdomen. 
The net spinning caddis fly, you will always find three hardened plates on the back of the thorax, plus those gills on the underside of the abdomen and perhaps also at the end of the body. And you'll never find these in that protective case, but sometimes in a net that is adhered to rocks. So now we are moving on to the Helgramite or Dobson fly. This is the family Corydalidae. Um, Helgramite and Dobson fly, they're synonymous. You, could, you will hear um, this taxa referred to as either, and either is correct, really. Um, the Helgramite or Dobson fly um, is quite large compared to the other taxa we'll find. It can get up to four inches long. And it is, has very distinctive mouth parts on the head. We have these very, very powerful mandibles. You can kind of see we have um, this kind of like shredding capability that the Jobson fly is a predator. So you can see that it will use that to kind of capture its prey um, in order to, to eat them. <laughs> uh, we have three pairs of segmented legs. And then along the abdomen, you'll find that we have these lateral filaments, this lateral hair-like projections that extend from the side, from both sides of the abdomen for every segment along um, down to the end of the body. So that's eight pairs of lateral filaments. And then at the end of the body, we have a pair of prolegs, these kind of small projections, these prolegs, and each of those prolegs has a pair of hooks. So here's what that might look like in your hand. You can kind of see they're rather large. Um, you can see these, these projections, these lateral filaments coming off of the side of the abdomen. And we have the pair of prolegs, each with a pair of hooks at the end of the body. Um, at the top here, these mandibles, um, you, you want to take care not to stick your finger right in the middle here because it is quite sharp and they can uh, latch on to you. Um, it's not a common thing. Uh, you know, I wouldn't develop a fear of Dawson flies in your sample um, or for any of these taxa, you know. Um, but, you know, you just don't want to very obviously stick your finger in there because they could close down on that and you'd get a little pinch. Some Dobson fly will have very obvious gills along the abdomen as well. So you will tend to see those kind of moving around uh, while they're in your bucket. They're a, kind of a soft texture as compared to the rest of the body. Um, but we still do see we have the lateral filaments, eight pairs along the abdomen. The alder flies are a cousin of the Helgramite. Um, in this picture, you might think that they could look a little bit similar, right? So they have uh, lateral filaments on the abdomen here as well. This guy only has seven pairs of, of uh, lateral filaments. Um, we do have mandibles also at the top of the head here. However, the alder fly is much, much smaller than the Dobson fly. The Dobson fly will be, you know, can get up to four inches long. The alder fly is, I would say, probably usually less than an inch long, um, sometimes even much smaller than that. So, you know, if you were to stick your finger near the mandibles here, that's not gonna cause a problem because it's so much smaller that it's really not going to be able to, to pinch onto your finger. It's, it's targeting much smaller prey. Um, we do have the filaments, however, coming off of the side of the body, but at the end of the body, we do not have the prolegs like we'll find in the Dobson fly. Instead, we have one single tail, one single filament at the end of the body. So here's a look at some different specimens of the alder fly. Always seven pairs of filaments on the side of the body and always one single tail at the end of the body. So just to, um, just to wrap this up, 
review the difference between the alder flies and the Dobson flies. The alder flies are much, much smaller than the Dobson flies. They will both have lateral hairs off of the side of the abdomen, but at the end of the abdomen, the alder fly has one single tail while the Dobson fly has a pair of pro legs, each with a pair of hooks. The Dobson fly uh, mandibles will be much larger and much more obvious to the eye than they are with the alder fly as well. Now we'll move on to the beetles. There's just a few beetles that we tend to find in New Jersey. Um, the riffle beetle larva is perhaps the most common that we'll find. It's rather small, a, a max of about a half of an inch long. Um, they will be a dark brown to black in color. And because they're so small, and they're kind of a, a bit rounded like you'll, you see in this photo. When you're looking at them in your tray, they just kind of look like little black commas in your tray. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to look for any distinguishing features um, beyond the fact that it's just a little black comma. Um, however, we'll kind of review some, some of those things now. Um, it does have a stiff body. So if you remember the caddis fly, right? It had the hardened segments on one, two, or three segments of its thorax. And the rest of the caddis fly abdomen was fleshy. With the riffle beetle larva, that hardened segment extends all the way down to the end of the body. So it's, it's hardened all the way down, nothing fleshy about the riffle beetle larva. We have three pairs of segmented legs and a pair of antenna, but you can see how small they are really in comparison to some of the other antenna and legs that we find. At the end of the body, um, you may find that there are gills present. Sometimes um, this operculum will be closed like it is in the top specimen here. So you can't see any gills, that operculum, that opening has been closed. Um, other times, like in this bottom example, this operculum, it has been opened. And so you can kind of see bits of that, that white bushy gill starting to stick out. And so that is, you can find the riffle beetle larva really in, in either condition. Now the riffle beetles are interesting because it is one of the very few examples where we find both the larval and the adult version underwater. With most of the other things that we're looking at, um, we have the larval um, phase underwater and then it goes to the side of the stream and emerges as a winged terrestrial adult. With the riffle beetle, it remains underwater in its adult form. So when it turns from its larval phase into its adult phase, it is really, really quite small, down to a 16th of an inch long. Um, they will have a head, they will have what kind of looks like the single segment of the thorax, and we will have an abdomen um, down at the bottom here. Three pairs of segmented legs, similar to um, in its larval phase, but in its adult phase, the legs are much more developed. Um, these will usually be uh, dark brown to black in color. And similar to the riffle beetle larva, when you're kind of looking at the bottom of your tray, they just look like little brown or black commas. Um, the riffle beetle adults will just kind of look like tiny little beetles at the bottom of your tray. Um, so there are a few other specimens um, of aquatic beetles that are possible to find. Um, but we would not expect you to be able to differentiate those in the field, um, especially without a, the use of a microscope. But fortunately for us, the pollution tolerance values are quite similar across the board. So um, they're generally pretty easy to identify and put on our sheet. The water penny beetle, this is a different type of beetle, family Siphenidae. Um, these are called a water penny because from the top, 
they kind of resemble a penny. They kind of have that copper look. Um, they are flattened from top to bottom. So when they adhere themselves to a rock, um, usually, you know, they, they will have a very similar color to the rock around them. And so it makes it difficult for predators who are coming by to distinguish them from the rest of the rock. So this is a really great protective strategy for the water penny beetle to take. But when you flip that water penny beetle over, you can see on the underside, it kind of resembles a mayfly. We have a head here and we have three pairs of segmented legs. We've got gills, branching gills along the abdomen, but it just so happens that it has evolved this enlarged um, kind of covering this enlarged exoskeleton um, to protect that underside from predators. So this is a, a very easily distinguishable taxa. Um, here's a look at what it might look like on a rock. Um, so, you know, very well uh, protected, very well camouflaged. Um, this is another one. You just want to make sure that when you're scrubbing the rocks, you, you really scrub them really well because they do a great job at clinging to those rocks. And we want to make sure that with every rock we pick up, we are capturing every single organism on that rock in our net. So we want to capture everything in that square foot that we're sampling. It's really important that we scrub those rocks carefully and then check them really well before we set them aside. Now we're getting into the true flies, um, which is order Diptera. There's so much diversity in, in the Dipteran order among all of the true flies. So with, with our purpose, with our identification, we are identifying down to family. So this is one step lower um, than, it, than it was for the orders mayflies, stonefly, caddisfly. Now we're looking at the family. Um, the water snipe fly is one example of a fly larva that you'll find underwater. We have a, a pointy head, it's, it's kind of tapered here, and you can see sometimes the, the actual head is kind of sticking out. This is this, this really kind of small ball looking structure at the end of that taper. Um, other times that will be retracted into the body. Uh, along the underside of the body, we will have prolegs. So you can kind of see those sticking out a little bit. And then at the end of the body, we have a V-shaped appendage. So really this is two appendages from the end of the body. Um, sometimes that V will have um, kind of hairy projections coming off of the side of it as well. So here's a look at some other kinds of water snipe larva. This uh, top picture is a view of the top of the specimen. So you can see that V shape really easily and the taper at the front, this is the tapered head. And that head in this example is retracted in, into the body. With this bottom example, this is a side view. So we're looking at the side of this specimen. And uh, from this vantage point, we can see those prolegs coming off of the side of the body. We can see that V-shaped appendage at the end of the body. And we see that tapered head. And in this example, the head is kind of poking out there and you can see that. Here is another look. They can kind of come in a variety of different colors and a variety of um, different kind of shapes. Sometimes they can be more bulbous, other times they can be um, more elongated, but you're always looking for the pointy head and the V-shaped appendage at the end of the body. The crane flies, this is another kind of fly that we'll find is a bit more rounded than the water snipe fly. So this head is not pointed at all. It's, it's very much rounded and it's kind of the same. Sometimes you will find the heads kind of sticking out. Other times it's been um, pulled back and retracted into the body. At the end of the body here, which is on the bottom, um, we have kind of like a star shape projection from the bottom. And these are called the spiracles. So the water snipe fly had the V shape, kind of very distinctive 
projections at the end of the body. Um, the crane fly will have these kind of pointy star-shaped spiracles. Here's another look at the cream fly. Um, in this top example, you can see kind of how fleshy and rounded this body is. Um, sometimes these segments can be a, a little bit more obvious. You can kind of see these, these enlarged segments here at the end of the body, which on the top example is on the left. This is the end. These, this is the star-shaped kind of finger-like projections, the spiracles. And then on the right side for this top picture, you can see the tiniest, cutest antenna you've ever seen in your life. We have a little bit of this head kind of sticking out. On the bottom example, the head is on the left and you can see that that head is retracted into the body. Of course, it's rounded and segmented all the way down and we have the spiracles pointing out at the end of the body on the right. The crane fly larva can sometimes have some distinct features. Some species um, may have this enlarged final abdominal segment. It kind of looks like it's been blown up like a balloon, um, but you will still see this rounded head shape and you will still see this star-like projection at the end of the body, the spiracles. In the bottom example, you see creeping welts. So this is like um, an underdeveloped pro leg. And this can kind of help that crane fly move around uh, on the bottom of the stream. They're not as well developed as pro legs, but they are um, kind of something to help it with locomotion. The black fly, this is our next example. Um, we will, we tend to compare the black fly to a bowling pin. So in this photo, the head, which has a very distinct hardened capsule is on the top. And we have the abdomen kind of widening out to this bulbous end, kind of looks like a bowling pin, right? Um, right under this hardened capsule head, we have a single pro leg, which you can see very easily on this bottom picture. We have, again, this hardened head, which is facing to the right. We have this single pro leg and the abdomen gets wider and wider until the end of the body here. Um, sometimes the black fly will have very uh, distinctive fan-like mouth parts. So this is um, the bottom right photo, you can kind of see these fans sticking out and this is coming off of the top of the head. And so in, in this top photo, you can see it will adhere the end of the abdomen um, to, the, to the, the substrate, the bottom of the stream. And it's able to just kind of float back and forth with these fan-like mouth parts in, in the water column, able to capture fine particulates as they're floating through the water column. The midge fly larva, family Chironomidae, is quite slender from head to um, the end of the body. We do have the hardened capsule head, um, and we have a pair of pro legs just underneath that head. We also have a pair of pro legs at the end of the body. The midge flies can be bright red. They can be white, they can be orange. Um, they come in a kind of a rainbow of colors. Um, here are two examples. You can see how different that head can look depending on the species that you find. So in, in this top example, the head is, is quite large in relation to the rest of the body. Um, on the bottom example, it's a little bit smaller, but in both examples, we have the pair of pro legs sticking out just under the head and then also at the end of the body. Midge fly larvae are probably, well, one of the most common taxa that you'll find. I would be shocked if we don't find any midges tomorrow. They're, they're almost everywhere. And they can come in all of these different kinds of body structures. But again, we have the hardened capsule head, a pair of pro legs under, underneath the head, and a pair of pro legs at the end of the body.
Now we're getting into our crustaceans. The first one that we'll look at is called a scud. Um, it's also sometimes referred to as a side swimmer. And that's because you will tend to see them on their side swimming around in the tray. So they're laterally flattened, meaning they're flattened kind of from side to side. Um, what we're looking at here, this is a side view and you'll see the head is facing left. Um, we have two pairs of antenna. Um, we have um, the thorax kind of fused into the abdomen and we've got seven pairs of segmented legs. They kind of look shrimp-like um, and that will be perhaps a, a little bit more obvious as we go about tomorrow. Um, scuds are also super, super common. So I'm sure we'll have a few of these swimming around our trays tomorrow. The sow bug is another crustacean. Whereas the scud is flattened side to side, the sow bug is flattened from top to bottom. So here we're looking at uh, kind of the top view of the sow bug. Uh, in this example, the head is facing up and to the left and the end of the body is here on the right. Um, so we have, similar to the scud, seven pairs of segmented legs and two pairs of antenna. We have a deeply segmented body. So the scud will kind of be more, more rounded. It's kind of like hunchbacked almost, um, but the sow bug, you will tend to find um, more flattened out in the tray, not kind of hunched over. The sow bug also has, you'll see this very rounded, enlarged final abdominal segment. Um, and so that's a kind of another distinguishing feature if you're wondering if you're looking at a scud or a sow bug, um, this enlarged abdominal segment at the end um, is another telltale sign that you have a sow bug. And this is just looking at them next to each other so we can uh, compare and contrast. The sow bug here on the left, we have a flattened from top to bottom and these deep segments along the entire stretch of the body with this rounded enlarged final segment. The scud is going to be flattened from side to side, generally found on its side. It will be rounded and um, will not have a final enlarged segment. It will instead have telsins. They're just kind of like projections sticking out of this side of the body. So um, just to be clear, in both of these examples, the head is facing left and the end of the body is facing to the right. So you can kind of see um, the antenna coming off of the, the top of the head on the left. The crayfish is another crustacean that we'll find, um, you know, very popular among creek goers everywhere. They tend to be uh, relatively easy to catch unless you're sampling with a net and sometimes <laughs> they're a little bit elusive because they're so mobile, they're so ambulatory, they're able to kind of scramble away um, from where we're sampling. Um, so they, they, you know, you've seen in a crayfish, they kind of look like a small lobster. They will have five pairs of legs. The first pair are adapted to have these pincers and we also have um, antenna coming off of the top. Um, so with, with crayfish, you know, just in general, you want to make sure that you're picking it up along the abdomen here um, so that, you know, you don't get kind of caught up in these pincers here. The crayfish can come in a variety of sizes. The smaller they are, probably the more difficult they are to identify, um, but you always just want to look, you know, for these pincers here and just for this general body structure, it's kind of unique among um, all of the taxa that we're identifying. Now we're getting into segmented worms. So we have looked at taxa at the order level. We have looked at taxa at the family level. With segmented worms, we're taking a step up. We're going farther up the taxonomic hierarchy to look at the class level. There's a lot of variability within each of these classes. Um, fortunately for us, most of the individual species within each of these classes has a similar pollution tolerance value. 
So we don't need to, what, once we identify something as a leech or we identify something as a worm, um, we don't have to go any further than that. We just record it as a leech or a worm and we move on. So it kind of makes our job a little bit easier as we're identifying in the field. So the leech will be a more flattened. Um, it has these kind of deep segments along the entire stretch of the body. And of course it will have these suckers at both ends of the body. The aquatic worms will be more cylindrical. They are still segmented. Um, they will look more like worms, <laughs> really. Uh, they will sometimes have short hairs on, on one side of the body or along the whole stretch. So here's a closer look at the leeches. In this top example, we're getting a look at the underside of the leech so we can get a closer look at this sucker. On the bottom, um, we're looking at the top view. And so sometimes they can appear white and kind of rounded and just look generally blobby. Um, other kinds of leeches that we'll find will stick you know, they will adhere their sucker to one part of the tray and they will extend their body out to the, to the other side of the tray. And so they're much longer and they have much more movement. So again, a lot of variability with the leeches, um, but we just want to find those suckers and that makes it for a pretty easy identification. And here's a look at a leech as it moves um, again, some of those taxa are pr pretty mobile. Oh, and I should mention, um, the leeches, you know, I, I feel like there's some concern about leeches um, with people who are, who are kind of unfamiliar with this taxa. They're worried that they're gonna, you know, suck their blood, right? Um, so sometimes if you're going into a stream or a lake where there are lots of leeches, you might want to do a little leech check you know, around your feet or in your ankles, um, just to pull anybody off who's who's adhering to you. Um, but in general, that's that's not very common unless you know it, it, in a specific kind of habitat. But in streams, that's not very common. So um, there's not much to fear with the leech. They're actually really cool taxa. The aquatic worms, again, a class lots of variability in the kind of worms we'll see. Some will be very rounded and look very much like an earthworm. Others will have a very thin, 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 thin line and be bright red and even look like they're kind of mashing into the net because they're so fine. Um, but any worm we find, we're just going to call a worm. And so it makes it easy for us. Now we're getting into the mollusks. First is the clam. So a clam or a mussel is going to be um, an organism that has the two pieces of shells connected by a single hinge. And so um, if you were to flip any of these guys over, you will see that there is a shell on the other side and it's kind of connected um, on the top here. We only find, we only count clams or mussels if the clam or mussel is still alive. So if that if the shell is still closed and there's still someone home inside, that's when we count the clams. We may find tons of clam shells where they're broken open um, and we would not count those clearly because there's, there's no one alive there. Um, so we're only counting live specimens. With the snails, we differentiate only two kinds of snails. We differentiate lunged snails from gilled snails. This of course has to do with the relative pollution tolerance value of each of these taxa. So a gilled snail means you know, that it has gills and it breathes underwater. Um, it needs dissolved oxygen to thrive. While the lunged snail breathes air and then it kind of comes down, floats back down underwater and is able to trap that air inside and it breathes just you know, regular air, oxygen from the air. So which one of these has a lower pollution tolerance value? 
if you said guild snail, you would be right. So the guild snail requires a, a better water quality. It requires more dissolved oxygen than a lung snail would require because it's breathing air. And so that is why we want to make sure that we distinguish between these two. Um, luckily, it's, it's relatively easy to make this um, characterization of the different kinds of snails. So if we're looking on the right here for the gilled snail, if we put the pointy bit facing up, like it is in these photos, we can determine if it's a gilled or lung snail based on which direction this opening is facing. So on the right side for these gilled snails, you can see with the pointy bit facing up, the opening is on the right side of the shell. And that means that it is a gilled snail. If the pointy bit is facing up and that opening is on the left, then you've got a lunged snail. Also in the lunged snail category are kind of all of the other snails we might find. So we could have these rounded snails, we could have limpets, all of that we would classify as a lunged snail. But if it's pointy and the opening is on the right, we definitely have a gilled snail. All others will be lunged snails. So here's a little mnemonic you might use to differentiate. A left equals lunged. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> um, and so guild equals good. Of course, that's not as useful when you're trying to make an identification, just looking at the specimen. Um, but left equals lunged. This is this, you might find that quite helpful. If it opens on the right, it's going to be guild. And that's good. <laughs> So now we will get into a dichotomous key and we're just gonna go through um, the key with one specimen. And I just like to provide a little bit introduction into how dichotomous keys work. If you've never worked with one, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. You start at the top of this key, you look at your specimen and you answer the questions accordingly. So this key that we're referencing is from the Stroud Water Research Center. And this is great because it does include all of the taxa that we will identify on our own data sheet. So the first question at the top asks if this specimen, and the specimen is here on the right, does it have jointed legs or no jointed legs? So look at this specimen. Um, we can see the head, the thorax, the abdomen, and coming off of the thorax, we have three pairs of segmented legs. And you can see that they're segmented because we have this kind of jointed bit in the middle. So with our first question, we say, yes, jointed legs. And then it asks how many legs we have in this example, six jointed legs. And so that will take us to page three. Um, and just so you know, I will have printouts of this particular key so we can practice with it in the field tomorrow. So we will now flip to page three to continue working through the key. And um, we've already identified that we have six jointed legs. The next question asks if it's found in a portable case or if there is a no portable case. I see no portable case, so we can continue moving down here. Um, the next question asks if there are wing pads or wings present. Now, I don't know if you can see this from home, but we do have this triangular bit kind of sticking out at the bottom segment of this, of the thorax. And this would be the start of wing pads. So we see this triangular bit on the back. Um, we can say definitively, yes, we do have wing pads. So we will go to page four. Oh, and I've um, adjusted the contrast a little bit to maybe help you see um, that we do have these triangular structures, the wing pads on the back of the body. So now on wing four, we've determined that we do in fact have wing pads. The next question asks us if we have tail filaments. 
So looking at the end of the body, we can find, yes, indeed, we do have tail filaments, which takes us to the left part of this key. And now we are deciding between three options, the stonefly, the mayfly, or the damselfly. And so at this point, you would read the text to determine if, uh, you know, which taxa you have found. So with this first option with the stonefly, two tail, tail filaments without abdominal gills. With our example, we have three tail of filaments, so that's not gonna fit the bill. Let's skip all the way to the other side here. For the damselfly, you would have three flat tail filaments or the gills and no abdominal gills. Well, I see we have these three tails, but we also have gills along the side of the abdomen. And so that puts us firmly within the ephemeropter category or the mayfly. Hip hip. <laughs> All right. So I just want to um, check in now and ask if there are any questions. Let me show the video. I think I see a raised hand. Um, go ahead, you can unmute. Uh, yes, uh, I asked a question just like a minute ago uh, in, the, in the chat. It's, uh, it's about like the app that's uh, included with the uh, micro invertebrate uh, like website. It's called like yes. uh, Pocket Micros. What do, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think those apps are absolutely great. I mean, macroinvertebrates.org is an excellent resource. Even if you don't um, download specific apps, and there are a handful of different apps to choose from. If you go to the app store, you can just kind of put in macro and vertebrate and, and a few options will pop up. Most of these options are great. Um, you could also navigate in your web browser on your phone if you're out in, out in the field and just literally go to macroinvertebrates.org and um, that will take you to a really useful key. Um, so, you know, on that note, I'm just going to take us to the website so that you can see what that looks like for yourself. Um, this is macroinvertebrates.org. Um, this website, by the way, is produced by Stroud Water Research Center, which is the same organization that made that, that dichotomous key we were just looking at. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it has basically the same questions, but kind of in this, in this wider format, all on a single page. You know, you start in the same place. Are there jointed legs? And you follow along. And so if you follow along here, and have a question about any of these questions, does it have wings or wing pads? Maybe you're saying, okay, what, what is a wing pad? You can click on this box and it will go ahead and show you different <laughs> options of wings or wing pads that you might see. Um, so this, I find this website particularly helpful because of the ability to click here and say, wait, what is a lateral filament? And it shows you exactly what it is um, that you're looking for. So I also just want to mention here that when we are doing our identification test on May 21st, it is open book, open everything. You will have access to your phone, to any printed materials that, that I will provide for you or that you wish to bring for yourself, any apps you want to use. It's all open to you. Um, this is not a test on memorization, you know. What I, what I need is for you to be able to know where to look to find the answer, right? Um, so if you have the tools in front of you, I want you to be able to use all of the tools that you need. And so uh, Laura and Eric, you might, you might download an app that you love and you can feel free to use that. Others might you know, like the look and feel of a different app, but all of them are serving the same purpose. And so um, you know, they're all, very open and, and welcome, you're welcome to use them. Okay. Um, any other questions at this point? No, but I have to say, uh, Aaron, that was a really great presentation. I, I thought you did a really great job explaining everything. Oh, thank you, Clea. It's only the 50th time I've done it. So. <laughs> 
done it. I've done it. I've, I've listened to it a few times. I know. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. I I really like the reminder, and it's it's great. Great. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I mean, even if you've been doing this for a while, it's it's sometimes nice just to get that that reminder. Um, Carolyn put in the chat. You can also buy some really fabulous Caddisfly jewelry. Yes. So you remember they make those hardened cases. Um, there is a, there are two women, they have a business, they run it out of West Virginia. I don't remember the name of their Etsy store right now, but if you look up Caddisfly Jewelry, you can find it. Um, they will, they basically harvest these Caddisflies, they have them in these huge tanks. And instead of putting them in the tanks with like bits of sediment or bits of rock or gravel, they'll put crushed up jewels in the bottom of the tank. Oh my God. And so the Caddisflies will take that and construct the case, um, you know, with those jewels, and uh, they make really beautiful creations, and and they sell them as earrings or necklaces or, or bracelets, you know, anything like that. So yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Um, we tried at the Watershed Institute to do it, and we could not get those caddislides to work. <laughs> so it is difficult, and to to really be good at it. So it's it's really interesting. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, well, I think now that it is 7.30, that, that was a lot of information. That's a lot to digest for sure. And so, um, you know, there's, there's more to the presentation, um, but rather than, than go through that now, I think that it's important that we just kind of sit with what we've heard um, I hope to give you guys a chance to kind of absorb it. If you're taking notes, kind of review that. And I'll send out this presentation and you can look at the following slides um, that are basically like a quiz. You know, they come up with a picture and you kind of look at it and figure out um, with your own materials, you can use any keys available to you and, um, and try to test yourself, you know, on your ability to, to make those IDs. So of course we will practice with that tons tomorrow. Um, I actually am gonna go back to the presentation just to share um, one more thing. Let's see, where am I? And this is about our work tomorrow. I just kind of want to go over um, what to expect there. Okay, so our field training is tomorrow. This is at Montgomery Veterans Park. Uh, we will be working on Pike Run. Um, so this park is just off, to, off of Harlingen Road in Montgomery or in, in Bellmead. Uh, it's sometimes called on, on Google, Google Maps. Um, we'll get started promptly at 9.30. So please arrive maybe 9.15. Um, to just kind of get settled and get your, your gear together so that we can head out to the stream um, at 9.30. Uh, for lunch, we will have a break from 12 to 12.45 for lunch. Uh, uh, and then we'll meet back at 12.45. There's kind of this 15 minute grace period and we'll start back up at one. Um, so you can feel free to bring your own lunch and just kind of enjoy your lunch in the park. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the, the downtown center of, of Montgomery is about seven, 10 minutes away. There's a Wawa there. So if you want to um, just head over there for lunch, that is also an option. Uh, so here's a general look at our agenda. I have it broken out into two sessions where we break into groups, but depending on the actual size of our group tomorrow, we may just kind of do it all together. Um, if we do it all together, then we would start uh, with session one by doing the habitat and physical assessment. Um, so we can get a good look at the stream, assess the habitat, figure out where all of those micro habitats are. And then after lunch in the second session, we'll do the macro invertebrate collection and ID. And then we'll have some discussion and do our gear decontamination at the end of the day. Uh, it has on this agenda, our wrap up around four it may not last this full time. It tends to take longer if we have a very large group. 
but with our group, we may kind of zoom through it a little bit quicker. So I just want to mention that this agenda is kind of subject to change as we as we see fit tomorrow. You can kind of all discuss it and break early for lunch or you know whatever. It's all um, open to us. So the field training is tomorrow, May 14th at Montgomery Veterans Park. Then our test day will be the following Saturday, May 21st. And this again will kind of be broken up into two sessions. The first session will be uh, with the field accreditation. So you'll be going out into the stream with Debbie Kratzer from New Jersey DEP. And we have basically a checklist of things that we're looking for and you go through your collection, you go through your habitat assessment and we'll make corrections along the way if we need to. And then you will also run through your 50 organism macroinvertebrate ID test. So I have preserved specimens that I'll bring out, set them out on the picnic tables there and uh, you'll have ample time, as much time as you need to get through all 50 of those organisms. And then of course, after that point, once you're accredited and pass your ID test, then you are all set to go for the actual water quality monitoring for data collection. And for that, you will be coordinating with your own uh, you know, partner organization, whether that's Rawway or Soundland, um, they'll coordinate that with you. Okay, wonderful. Well, then I will see you all bright and early <laughs> at 9.30 tomorrow morning. We may have a sprinkle or two um, if there is thunder or lightning, uh, we'll just kind of hang out in our cars for a couple minutes while it passes, but it shouldn't be anything too uh, wild and crazy. Um, you'll want to make sure you bring a water bottle. If it's sunny, you know, a hat and sunscreen. And uh, if you're clumsy, maybe a change of clothes if you feel like taking a tumble into the stream. <laughs> uh, so just, yeah, come prepared and uh, we will have some fun tomorrow. I will see you all then. Thank you. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good night.